I'm Dency Nelson, and in 1980, I was Dave's cue card guy on the morning The David Letterman Show. And then in 1982, I came back as a talent researcher for Late Night with David Letterman. And then I was one of Dave's first stage managers, along with Biff Henderson, on Late Night with David Letterman. Dave's point of view was something that was done a couple of times on the show, but the first time was on the morning David Letterman show, and it was a camera walking as Dave's point of view as he came backstage to start the show and ran into various staff and uh, crew members. Oh, my God, David, you're shining. I have to fix this. Okay, thanks. Oh, you look wonderful. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, David, this is the suit you were to wear with that tie. Yeah, I screwed up the suit? Yeah, well, this was the one oh, we decided on. I got a weasel on. What difference does it make? <laughs> okay. David, we got a little problem. What's that? The entire audience is Norwegian. They don't speak a word of English. But if you really want to make them laugh, use words like fjord and fish. I think it'll kill them. Right. Oh. Does this weasel guy spell his name W-E-A or W-E-E? -E? Let's see, W-E-A is weasel. I don't know, just make it more. Ten seconds. Okay, you have to do it yourself. The producer uh, was Bob Stewart, and Dave picked him to produce because he had done a lot of $20,000 pyramid, I believe. So we're kind of rehearsing for a couple of weeks. It's understood that um, this producing situation is not working. Before we even went on the air that first Monday in June, Bob Stewart was no longer there. And Merrill, as the head writer, took over not only head writing, but producing that show. As Dave, to this day, will give full credit, the brains behind understanding what Dave was, Meryl Marco, partnering with the brilliant David Letterman. I read the NBC research, and if we would have had more sex, more violence on the show, I think we would have done better. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, February. <laughs> and for the gals. <laughs> January. Whoa! Maybe you've got something there. <laughs> In the summer of 1980, we were already starting to figure that maybe we weren't going to make it to Christmas. So Dave decided to do his holiday Christmas show in July. I was enlisted to, along with Meryl Marco, be happy skaters. The rink down there at Rockefeller Plaza, and uh, covered now with the protective umbrellas. <laughs> Home of the ice skating waiters, there's one there. On the... And in just a minute, oh, here come some happy skaters now on the on their way down to the rink at the... For my money, Christmas just wouldn't be Christmas without ice skating at Rockefeller, Rockefeller Plaza. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> it's like a Courier and Ives postcard, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Uh... Rich Hall, who was one of the David Letterman family of the air on the Morning David Letterman show, came up with an idea, which of course really pleased me. As I was the cue card guy and was holding up the words for Dave, maybe everything that Dave did was prompted by what was on the cue cards. One of the unsung heroes is the cue card man. We were lucky on this show because our cue card man, Dency Nelson, is one of the best in the business. <laughs> Dency Nelson is not only charming, intelligent, and handsome, but when I hear the phrase wonderful human being, the first name that comes to my mind is Dency Nelson. 5741, and uh, what a show we have lined up for you people today. And, uh... <laughs> You know what I said about doing one right? Can't be done, apparently. We got lots of viewer mail and requests and fans of the show. Someone had asked Dave if uh, they could have their anniversary party on the show. That couple came on. We got their favorite singer, Rusty Draper. At the end, there was the deadly combination of uh, giant, powerful sparklers and huge paper confetti leaves coming down into, onto the stage and the sparklers caught the confetti flowers on fire. It was the best publicity the morning show had gotten in its entire run. Plus, as an added attraction on this very show, on this very stage, I'm going to learn how to milk a cow. That's to, oh my goodness, we've got, we've got a fire, well.
in October of 1980, we already knew that we probably weren't going to make it through the end of October. But David already solicited folks who wanted to have the David Letterman show done from their home. And the Goldsworthys from Cresco, Iowa, submitted a 100-word essay as to why they should be the ones to have the David Letterman show done from their home. So, of course, we went to Cresco, Iowa. Okay, let's go. Well, good morning. It's Wednesday, October 22nd, and we're coming to you from the beautiful countryside of northeastern Iowa, and we're a couple of miles outside of the city of Cresco, Iowa. Second, I want you just to see a little bit of the Goldsworthy home. These folks are, look at them run. <laughs> They're standing around in the kitchen where the, uh, they have a turkey in the oven. Cloris, everything under control? Uh, just a minute now, we're just getting things <laughs> Okay, while Cloris is rearranging things and remodeling, put a coat of paint on the house while you're at it, Cloris, if you can. Again, we knew we were doomed. The show was going to be canceled, and then everything in the last weeks was all sort of with that awareness. And Dave was kind enough to uh, create the bumpers going in and out of the commercials, featuring our resumes and our pictures so that we could advertise ourselves for future work. So the last day of the Morning David Letterman Show. That was a, a, a very emotional day for all of us. David already said what was going to be replacing him, Card Sharks and Las Vegas Gambit. And Dave had a buzzer at, at home base. Oh, okay. Uh, famous Rivers for 20, Art. <laughs> Pretty much all you need for a show, isn't it? The Bible. No, I'm sorry, it's not the Bible. Can you take it Rhode Island? No, time's up. Well, Our closing number was staff dressed up in giant cards dancing on stage while Harv Mann sang about the Las Vegas Gambit and the game show that was going to replace us. It was a tearful, full day. On the Morning David Letterman Show, we did the first iteration of Dave's point of view, and then on Late Night, we did uh, Paul's point of view. Three minutes to air, Paul. Do you know what you're going to say to Dave tonight at the top of the show? No, I can't find my writers. Paul, Paul, you're not going to say you're the king of ging again, are you? King of ging again. Will, Will, what do you think this is? Sinatra gig? It's Letterman. Three minutes, you're not even dressed yet. Wait a minute. Hiram. Hiram, we're on the air. In two minutes, get your shoes off. What do you think this is? 30 seconds, Paul. Wait, I, I think I got it. When Dave comes out tonight, say to him, Dave, one size fits all. There it is. One size fits all. Doesn't make any sense. All right, here we go. Andy Kaufman was, uh, I think, on the show several times, but even on the Morning David Letterman show, he always came with the unexpected, that's for sure. I know this sounds like a cliche, but uh, if you could earn any extra money that you have, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to have... One of the uh, infamous moments, Andy Kaufman came on with the neck brace with uh, Jerry Lawler. We all were sure that it was real. With Andy Kaufman, you never knew. There was a big confab in the control room. NBC wanted to know that it was real, that it wasn't staged, and they were just looking at the tapes and no one could identify whether it was staged or it was real. It lived, it, it went on the air. I am sick of this bullshit. You are full of bullshit, my friend. I will sue you for everything you have. I will sue your ass. You're a motherfucking asshole. As far as I'm concerned, you hear me? A fucking asshole. 
Fuck you! I will get you for this! I am sorry, I am sorry to use those words on television. I apologize to all my kids. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But you, you're a fucking asshole! A fucking asshole! I think, uh, I think you can use some of those words on TV. I'm not... But, but what you can't do is throw coffee. I've said it over and over again. Calvert DeForest, he became Larry Bud Melman. He pretty much uh, would do anything he was told. And even when things went wrong, he was a trooper and just kept going. We did our Christmas show and one of the bits was Larry Bud Melman reading A Night Before Christmas to some children. A very beautiful antique book was picked up. Calvert opens it, and it was in French. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Oh, now I gotta read Spanish. Je pourquoi avez vous? Oh. <laughs> not a creature with story, not even a mouse. And, oh, God. <laughs> and Santa Claus came down the chimney. <laughs> and it turned out to be a very Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. It was magic, wasn't it? <laughs> On the very last Late Show with David Letterman, the last song was uh, Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl and Everlong. And it was underneath a series of stills over all the years of the Letterman shows that Barbara Gaines painstakingly over months had produced to replace what had been ordered by an outside entity that just didn't tell the story. There's so many things that make the David Letterman shows unique, but I don't think you're gonna find anything that comes as close to the loyalty, the sense of family, the lives that were changed, uh, people aspiring to be and then having those aspirations rewarded by being a part of that show. What Barbara did was brilliant. It brought tears to my eyes because she captured what it was to be a part of the David Letterman family. I would stand by this today. He ran by the infamous Oprah Uma in his dressing room before the show. Vince, should I use it? I said, Dave, that's you. Of course you gotta use it. Dave marches to the beat of a different drummer. And that's why he used David Letterman. <laughs> <laughs>